Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee hearing. There are several hearings this morning. My name is Carl Rose. I'm chair of the committee. This is Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agendas. We have a 945 agenda uh, for uh, governor's message and a House bill and several um, resolutions. We have a 1030 agenda for a deferred HB uh, for several deferred House bills. And we have a 1001 agenda for a, uh, another um, resolution. The other members of the committee are Vice Chair Keo Kalole, Senator Ocasio, Senator Gabbard, Senator Lee, Senator Mercado Kim, and Senator Favela. The meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business tomorrow, March 24, at 10 a.m., and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For the people testifying remotely today, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. There is a two-minute limit for testifier. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already received your written testimony, but we will try to come back to you if it's a temporary glitch. Uh, I'll be reading a list of people who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website, www.capital.hawaii.gov, capital with an O. You will find a link to testimony on the status page for the measure you're interested in. That's it. Let's go ahead and get started on the first agenda, which is the 945 agenda. First up on 945 is Governor's message 520 for Kishia Sakugawa for the Board of Registration of the Islands of Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Taho'olawe for a term to expire June 30, 2024. Uh, I do not believe we have any testifiers on this, on this nomination. Is that correct, uh, Elena? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and the, the nominee is not here either. Is that right? No, oh, he's not here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and for members, I have not for for this for for these particular offices of board registration, I have not uh, encouraged people very hard to either submit testimony or to come. So, don't, don't please don't hold that against them. Uh, but we will move on to um, HB twelve sixty three. This establishes a system of graduated penalties for violations of the ignition internet interlock law. Requires proof of compliance with the Ignition interlock law to be eligible to apply for a driver's license. Uh, first up on HB 1263 is James Tobby for the public defender. And don't see him. And the public defender is in opposition. Next is Ed Sniffen for the Department of Transportation. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Lynn Araki Regan from the State Department of Transportation on behalf of um, Deputy Director Sniffen. DOT stands on its written testimony and support. As reflected in our written testimony, the DOT is recommending a graduate, graduated approach to reduce res, recidivism rates for OV, OVUII. Um, we believe that the passage of this bill will encourage the change in behavior of the driver to not drink and drive, and more importantly, to save lives on our roadways. We're available for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. I see Mr. Tabe has joined us. Go ahead, Mr. Tabe. This is a HB 1263 on the ignition interlock. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I apologize for my technical difficulties here. Uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee, uh, under this bill, uh, for an offender to get his or her license back, um, Basically, what he or she must install an ignition interlock. And this means that even if the, the driver or the offender does not have a car or, or does not have a car, he or she will have to get a car to install the interlock device. Um, and this also affects people who can't afford the ignition interlock as well. I mean, this, they're quite expensive, uh, even at the half price that the uh, the indigent program that they may have, uh, it's still beyond the means of a lot of people. So basically what it is, is that people who can't afford to drive or to own a car or to 
before the ignition interlock will not have the ability to ever get their license back. I mean, I guess it's what's best put is, I think driving is a privilege. We, we, we acknowledge that, but this privilege shouldn't be uh, just for the, for those who can afford it. It should be for everybody. So um, otherwise I'll stand on my testimony and be available for questions. Thank you. Uh, next is Trisha Nakamatsu, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney for Honolulu. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu on behalf of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Department. We uh, definitely support the intent of the bill. We wholeheartedly agree in increasing the safety, um, increasing enforcement of OBII offenders on our roads, but we do have concerns about the particular effects of this bill, similar to the concern, well, basically the same concerns that the public defender just expressed that due to the way this particular bill is crafted, it would basically preclude anyone from ever getting their driver's license back if they granted they were offender, they made a mistake. Um, but we somehow it just doesn't seem fair that that could be held against them for the rest of their lives simply because they can't afford to get an ignition interlock or they don't have a legal vehicle on which to get an ignition interlock installed. Um, we were part of a working group which worked very, very hard to craft um, other types of legislation to strengthen OVII enforcement and laws. Um, that group would like to meet again to revisit OVII laws. Weren't able to do it last year because of the global pandemic. But the, one of the next things on the list was in fact compliance-based enforcement of which this would be one example. However, our testimony lists a number of different types of ways that other states have um, chosen to do compliance-based enforcement because there's so much information, there's so many different ways. And of course, if you've taken a look at our OVII laws, you realize our OVI laws are quite complex as well. Um, finding a, a good fit for our state and for our laws will take more time um, than simply the next month or two. Um, and as our testimony also, uh, prior testimony may have indicated the prior efforts by that working group actually took the course of five months, I believe, meeting every two weeks. Um, very intensive work by that group. So we're really proud of that. But they would like additional time, and this is something that they could take a look at. We're available for questions, if any. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Justin Kohler, prosecuting attorney for Kauai County in support. Next is Joanne Hamaji Oto for Smart Start LLC. Good morning, Chair, Vice Good Chair, morning. and members of the committee. Joanne Hamaji Oto, Territory Operations Director for Smart Start LLC, Hawaii Corporate Office. I'm offering testimony um, today in strong support of House Bill 1263. This important bill will require interlock users in Hawaii to demonstrate they're able to drive sober before removing the device. Interlock compliance-based removal is law in 34 states and is important teaching sober driving behavior. Currently, OVUI offenders in Hawaii merely have their interlock removed, whether they have demonstrated they've um, proven their sobriety to drive or not. One of the biggest challenges facing Hawaii's interlock program is eligible offenders will wait out the revocation period and do not install an interlock. Unfortunately, many choose to drive unlicensed and uninterlocked. A concern was raised in the previous hearings regarding the cost of the interlock for those that may have trouble paying for it. I would like to assure you that the Hawaii interlock program has an indigent program available for those that qualify to help reduce the cost associated with interlock. The program has been in place since the start of the program in 2011 and has been working to assist the participants who qualify for financial relief. The Hawaii Department of Transportation established a program to provide for the transportation relief for the interlock costs and related charges to the participants. Um, the participants who applied for such assistance qualified for that program um, under the food stamp, under STAT program, or free services under the Older American Act or Development, Developmentally Disabled Act. And I'm happy to speak further about that. Under current state law and per contract terms with HDOT, if participant qualifies for receiving the financial relief, the installation and monthly service fees are discounted at 50% off the standard rate. That cost to the participants is $1.48 a day. While I do understand it's definitely a cost, it is insignificant when it's compared to the human cost and to the community when a past offender drives before demonstrating that they can do so responsibly. It's about public safety, keeping our roads safe and saving lives. Um, we urge you to strongly pass, we strongly urge you to pass HB 1263 as it will help strengthen Hawaii's interlock program. Thank you very much. 
Next up is Tara Casanova Powell for Casanova Powell Consulting in support, uh, Traffic Injury Research Foundation in support, Carrie Bennis or Benish, Chair of Strategic Highway Safety Plan also in support, Bradney Oxdahl for Foundation for Advancing Alcohol Responsibility in support, uh, Melissa Pavlicek, I see you yet. Yeah. Good morning. Aloha, Senator. I have a deep personal connection to this issue and three beloved family members of a coworker were lost in 1997 to a drunk driver who drove four times over the legal limit. I currently work with Smart Start and I believe it is largely in part that I was selected because of my passion for strengthening Hawaii's drunk driving laws. I'm very, um, emotionally involved in this, so please excuse me, but I feel that allowing drivers to continue to blow into an indication interlock device while impaired and still up until the day of their license revocation, blow impaired into a device before having it removed just demonstrates a lack of responsibility and really makes me fear not only for my life, but the, the lives of those others on the road, including my children. So I understand, I'm, I'm actually don't understand the, the uh, adamant requirement that a person get their driver's license because I do understand that people can get a state ID if they aren't able to drive responsibly. But just to sum up my, my comments, DOT, Smart Start, others and myself included, actively participated in the working groups that Trisha Nakamatsu mentioned. And I, I believe that DOT, the Kauai County prosecutors, SmartSart and others have found a way to support compliance-based ignition interlock legislation like 34 other states. And as a matter of public safety, I ask that you please advance this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is... Um... Leanne Sumita, General Manager for AAA Hawaii American Automobile, Automobile Association, and she is in support as well. That's all the testimony we have on HB 1263. Members, any questions? Chair, I do have a question. Senator Acasio, followed by Senator Kim. Oh, it could uh, possibly go to, um, where did she go? Uh, the Smart Start or it could be DOT as well. But my question is basically, as I reading the, the measure, if a person doesn't have a driver's license, how will they be able to show that they've been driving in compliance with an interlock device if they don't have a license? I can answer that for you. Um, so in order to drive, currently in order to drive legally under a revoked license for OVUII, there's three things that a driver must have, a offender must have. Number one is the interlock installed in their vehicle, a, gov a government issued photo ID, and the interlock permit um, given by ADLRO, which is that admin, administ administrative driver's license verification office. So those are, those are the three things that um, an offender um, will need in order, to be, in order to be considered to drive legally under their revoked license. Okay. Thank you. So I don't understand. Sorry, Senator Kim. <laughs> A question for the prosecutor, not the prosecutor, for the public defender, Mr. Tabe. Mr. Tabe. Yes, Senator. You talked about the cost. Can you tell us exactly how much it costs and what is the what is the subsidy given if you can if you qualify? Well, I think that could probably be. Uh, better answered by uh, the smart start people, but okay. I believe it's approximately 80 something dollars a month, so to speak, but, uh, and then there's an initial cost as well. So, uh, but I think the exact costs, I think other, there's other individuals here. Okay, so Joanne, can you give us that? $9 a month, that is the standard fee, but if um, you qualify for the partial financial relief, we I'm sorry, discount. Could you, could you repeat that? We, you're, the very first thing you said was right. cut off. I'm sorry. Um, it's currently the standard fee is $89 a month. That's the service fee monthly calibration for the device. If um, a participant qualifies for the partial financial relief, we discount it 
that cost to 50% off. So it's $44.50. It comes out to $1.48 a day for the participant. And the initial installation cost? The initial installation fee to install the device is $84. We also discount that at 50% off. $84. Okay. And again, if you don't have a vehicle, you don't own a vehicle and you borrow somebody's vehicle. That's fine as well. The current statute does not, you're not required to be the registered owner of the car in order to install an interlock. As long as you drive an interlock car, you have the interlock permit and you have a, a government issued photo ID. Those are the three things that you will need in order to be legal, quote unquote, um, under a revoked license. You'll be fine if you have those three things. Okay. Or drive okay. a revoked license. But if it's not your vehicle and it's somebody else's vehicle, you install the interlock in there and the yes. person who owns the vehicle I mean, you have to have approval from the person who owns the vehicle. What if yes. they don't? Want, what if they uh, don't want to have their car put in? And are they then have to blow in order to drive the vehicle? So we provide training for everybody that uses the vehicle. That's not only the the um, participant themselves. It's anybody that will be driving the vehicle. We provide that training for free. And if they're using, let's say, if another family member is allowing them to use their car to install the vehicle because that participant does not have a vehicle, all we require is a letter from them, a signed letter from them, and we'll put that on their account stating that they give permission um, to install the vehicle, the interlock on this person's vehicle. Right. So in order for me to use the vehicle, if I'm the owner and I'm not the one convicted, yes, I have to blow Yes, you would have to. So we will provide you training on how to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Um, I do have a question. I forget who raised it uh, about people. Who, I think maybe it was uh, Deputy Prosecutor Nakamatsu concerned concerning expressing concern about people just waiting out the uh, revocation period. Well, we understand that is a concern. Um, with the current state of the laws. So um, my, my question is pretty okay. specific. So we, there's there's specific periods in the, well, they're, they're blanked out right at the moment, but there's specific periods in the bill for how long you have to go without blowing uh, blowing clean. So what what's to stop someone from just um, waiting, out waiting that. that period too? Um, cur currently the, I don't think there's anything to prevent someone from doing that. If they just wanted they to just, get it installed in a vehicle and let the vehicle sit there. They could do that. They could do that. I believe okay. they could do that. Okay. Uh, either um, Ms. Hamagioto or Melissa Pavlicek, could you, is it, can you confirm that that's the way it would work? That's not the way it would work under this bill in terms of the, when you insert the number of days, let's say it's mm -hmm. 90 days or 30 days, whatever the number of days is, mm -hmm. they, then you would be required to show compliance that you were able to blow into the device without being impaired. Right now, it is the situation where you could have the device installed and just not use the vehicle. And this is really the intent of the compliance-based removal to change behavior so that it can be demonstrated that you're responsibly blowing into the device, not impaired. Okay, and but if you're but if you're impaired and you know you're impaired, then you, you if you still you have not to, you should not be driving or attempting to drive, right? Right, you but you wouldn't. But if you still have some judgment left, you're not going to even try. So you're going to have a you're not going to have any uh, above above standard blood alcohol levels, right? So you could. I, I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing. I'm just trying to understand it. So if, yes. if somebody decided, okay, I, I want to, I want to be able to drive. Uh, I'm going to, I got a car that I can put this on. I put it on, but you know what? I don't really need to drive. I'm going to take the bus for the next however many days. And so I won't get any, so there's no, no possibility that I'm going to get any uh, negative uh, over, over limit um, samples. Then there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Right. The intent of this legislation would be you have the device on there, you're going to want to drive eventually, you know, and not, and you have to be not impaired in order to drive. Okay. Okay. Unlike All right. the current situation yeah, where, I understand. yeah. 
Okay, members, any other questions? All right, thanks very much, everyone. We'll go ahead and move on to the next bill. Uh, actually, it's a Rezo, uh, S, uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 140, asserting that racism is a public health crisis and urging the state to commit to recognizing and addressing the resulting inequities. First up on SCR 140 is Sandy Ma, Common Cause of Hawaii. Not available, Chair. Not available. Uh, um, with comments, Michael Galoyo Jr., LGBT Caucus of the, Demo uh, the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Also not available. Also in uh, that one, um, he's in support. Cat Brady, Community Alliance on Prisons. Aloha. There you are. Good morning. Aloha, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Keoho Kalole, and members of the committee. Cat Brady testifying um, on behalf of Community Alliance on Prisons. You know, we are really happy that the legislature is actually tackling, tackling um, racial inequity. We know that if, you know, this is rampant in our community. And um, it's pretty shocking. And I think we were all pretty shocked when a, a white supremacist was um, running as a Republican in the House. And we just think, wait a minute, what are we doing? So I guess the thing that really shocked me is that with all the talk about racial equity, the legislature has never tackled the fact that Native Hawaiians are constantly over-criminalized and incarcerated in their country. So this resolution calls for good things, you know, eliminating disparities and all that, but it's disingenuous if we ignore all the research that has been going on for 50 years that shows the um, disparate treatment of Native Hawaiians in the system. And now it's Pacific Islanders as well. So, I mean, our prisons are brown and it is shameful because we're incarcerating people who are houseless, people who are on the lowest um, economic rung of the, the ladder and people who are contending with public health and social, you know, uh, challenges that they deal with every day. You know, Department of Justice came here in 1998. They were shocked at the intergenerational incarceration in Hawaii. That was 23 years ago. Not anything has changed. So unless the government actually models racial equity in its policies and how we deal with our communities, um, it's just a thought. We need implementation. We need peace in this world. Mahalo. Thank you. Next is Jen Wilbur, Director of Advocacy for YWCA Oahu. Not available, Chair. Thank you. Uh, in support, she was in support. Okay. Keave Kaholokula, um, MD for Johnny Burns School of Medicine, in support. Jalen Murakami for Hawaii Public Institute. Hawaii Public Health Institute in support, Lori Field, Planned Parenthood Votes Northwest in Hawaii in support, Office of Hawaiian Affairs in support, Kathleen Algeyer for Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks in support, Eric Abe, Policy Director for Hawaii Primary Care Association in support, Dara Carlin uh, with comments, Gerard Silva in opposition, Victoria Anderson in support, Barbara Best in support, David Anderson in support, Carolyn Kunitaki in support, Lori Boyle in support, Holly Broman in support, Don Viviani in support, Raylan Reno Yeomans in support, Wendy Gibson Viviani in support, Mandy Fernandez, ACLU of Hawaii, also in support. That's the testimony we have on SCR 140 members questions. I just have a quick one on Center for the. You know, I, I know I talked about the other bill, and thank you for reminding me, you and uh, Senator Jared, about this bill. Uh, I, I concur. I, I totally agree. It's a uh, long overdue, and I'm very glad and happy that we're finally hearing a bill like this that to protect everyone, not just one race, but all races, um, especially knowing that the Native Hawaiians and <clears throat> going forward. I just want to just thank you guys for hearing this bill on behalf of my family and everyone else. Thank you, guys. Well, my pleasure. Any other questions or comments? Um, Senator Casio, go ahead. I do have a comment. It's not so much a question, but it's it's really um, you know taking up the same idea that um, Mrs. Brady brought up, and it's it's really about 
I would love to see the idea in this resolution embedded within the bills that we pass, because what I've been seeing is quite the opposite. There's tons of embedded racism and systemic violence in a lot of the criminal criminalizing uh, bills that we are passing this year through our committees um, and, and even on the floor, and including the building of a new prison. This is really about addressing that deeper systemic racism. And it's, it's a nice idea, again, and of course I signed on because I believe in the idea, but I also would like to see it in practice in terms of the bills that we continue to pass and the ideas that we espouse. Mahalo. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's see. I do have a question, but I don't know if anybody here. No, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next reso or pair of resos in this case. This is SCR 149 and Senate Reso Resolution 115 requesting that the United States Congress pass a law that criminalizes any act by a current or former law enforcement official, officer, military personnel, or politician that is contrary to the oath to uphold the Constitution. First up on 149 is Dark Harlan in support, Victoria Anderson in support, Lamomi Khan in support, Michael Michael Loyu uh, Sr. in support, Cheryl, and Cheryl B. with comments for the companion resolution SR 115 Gerald Silva's in opposition. Oh, I'm sorry, Gerald Silva's in support. Lamomi Khan is in support. James Mann is in support. And I'm sorry if I said that. No, okay, that was right. Uh, there's no one here to ask questions of members, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next pair of resos. That would be SCR 150 and SR 116. Requesting the Department of the Attorney General to propose legislation that criminalizes any acts by eligible public officials, including local law enforcement, that violate their oaths to uphold the United States Constitution and Hawaii State Constitution. First up on SCR 150 is Lance Goto, Deputy Attorney General. Morning. Morning, Chair and committee members. Lance Goto with the Department of the Attorney General. Uh, we just submitted uh, comments and concerns, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Dark Harlan in support, Victoria Anderson in support, Mike Goloyu Sr. in support, Lemomi Khan in support, Marilyn, Marilyn Ruth Yamamoto with comments. And on the companion resolution, SR 116, uh, Lance Goto again, if you care to say anything more. Oh, no, nothing okay. more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gerald Silva in support, I mean, Gerard Silva in support, James Mann in support. And that's it. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Goto? I have, I have a question. Senator Kim. Oh, Mr. Goto, can you expound on your comments? I've been reading your testimony, but um, can you expound on it? Um, I, I, it's just that um, this this resolution simply asked us to look at a proposed legislation that's going to create laws criminalizing uh, acts by public officials uh, that violate their oath to uphold the, con the Constitution. Um, it doesn't uh, purpose and justification for that is not clear um, in terms of what specific uh, types of conduct uh, we're really looking at trying to prohibit. That is also unclear. Um, so that that's my only comments is that um, we're not sure where this is going and what type of conduct uh, we want to criminalize. I had a similar concern just trying to figure out what what violation would constitute um, being criminalized when um, the oath itself is quite broad, right? right. And um, so I guess it would take a court of law to determine whether or not you did in fact violate your oath? Well, I mean, the, this reso is asking us to propose um, 
basically the creation of certain crimes that relate to um, the violation of oath to uphold the constitution. And it's kind of a, a, a negative. It's like a failure to uphold the constitution rather than um, prohibiting specific affirmative conduct. Um, this is saying where you're committing of your failing to uphold the constitution in some way. Uh, I'm not clear on what kind of acts or conduct that would constitute. Um, and we're gonna criminalize that. Basically you'll be subjected to criminal penalties for that. Um, and it's really important when we start creating criminal laws to be really clear uh, for everyone as to what we're pro specific conduct we're prohibiting, what and, and with a specific state of mind when, when you're doing it. Uh, so if, if in the, well, the constitution does talk about clean environment, clean air and so forth. And if for some reason I was to, I don't know, drive a car that, that put fumes into the environment that is, you know, not clean environment and so forth, as an elected official who took that oath, would I be somehow then in violation? And um, I mean, I'm just trying to find out how far this goes. It seems like it's very open ended. And um, that's, that's the point where we just wanted to make. So we, okay. so it's we need really to ambiguous. Zim zero in on on what it is we're looking at. Okay, appreciate right. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Senator yeah. Casio. I have a, a bearing, in mind, bearing in mind that we have another hearing with uh, joint with Hawaiian at 1030. Go ahead. So, Mr. Goto, um, for example, does the judiciary determines what is constitutional, correct? Uh, the court, could, yes. OK, so and then we all took an oath um, to uphold that constitution. And so if we have a bill, for example, that the judiciary testifies on, and specifically states that it's unconstitutional um, and we then pass it through committee, are then we subject to the violation that is uh, written in this resolution? If, if you pass a bill that the court has determined is unconstitutional, uh, that has, um, they, for example, they're testifying. This happened last Friday, for example. So it's a real live situation. Um, H, we, the committee voted to approve HB 1326, HD 1. And even though the, you know, the Supreme Court test, I mean, the, the judiciary testified that the bill ran afoul um, to the Sixth Amendment. So what does that, what position then would this, SCR put us in, in that kind of scenario? Well, this SCR is asking the AG to go back and propose criminal legislation um, and to criminalize um, certain conduct that where officials fail to uphold the constitution. And I suppose in your you know, example, that's a thing that would be considered. I'm not sure. We could take it one step further, right? Because if the if the law passes and then so, it gets challenged, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, and the court knocks it down and says it's unconstitutional, then as a body, all of us who voted for it would then, because now it's a ruling of the court. So would we then be in violation? Well, depending on what it your, is you drafted. Well, your act would have probably would have preceded the determination by the court. And so at the time you, you, you passed the law. Um, so, yeah. So this, this is exactly why, I mean, I, I'm, it's not my, it's not my reso, but I think this is exactly why the introducer of the reso was interested to see what the AG's opinion is. Cause there are a number of issues that are not altogether clear because of course you can always um, at the legislature, we can change the constitution or we can put bills out to put a question on the ballot to change the constitution. So asking to change the constitution isn't necessarily unconstitutional. It just depends on how you do it. 
So that, I think that's the purpose of the bill. I, I mean, the Rezo. So I, I, there's a lot of unanswered questions there when that's kind of like, I think that's kind of why they wanted the AG to take a look at the question. Any other questions, members? Okay, um, I'm ready to go into decision making unless someone feels the need to do um, to go to a uh, side room and discuss anything in particular. Uh, I don't see anybody, so let's go ahead and go on into the uh, decision making on the the um, the other two agendas are decision making only, so we'll get to get to them. Uh, and the 9:45 agenda, GM 520 is first. This is uh, Kisha Sakugawa for. The Board of Registration for the Islands of Maui, Molokai, Ilanai, and Koho Olave uh, for a term to expire June 30th, 2024. Recommendation is to um, advise and consent. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Uh, members, GM 520. Recommendation is to advise and consent. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Ocasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee. Excused. Is excused. Senator Favela. Oh, Aye. Okay. Oh, Sorry. That's Lee. That's, uh, members, uh, Chair, all members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Uh, next up is HB 1263 relating to in ignition interlock devices establishes a system of graduated penalties for violations of the ignition interlock law. Uh, requires proof of compliance with the ignition interlock law to be eligible to apply for a driver's license. Recommendation here is to pass with some amendments. Um, so the amendments will be that if you don't own a car or otherwise have permission to install an interlock device in, in a car you drive, the revocation period will be 50% longer than the normally applicable period, unless the applicable period is lifetime revocation or that uh, HRS 291-44.5 applies, which is the drive to work provision. We'll go ahead and fill in the PUKAs. Uh, so for the first offense, it would be 60 days um, uh, clean, clean samples. For the second offense in 10 years, it would be 90 days and 90 consecutive days. And for the third offense within 10 years of two or more convictions, it would be six months. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and see. I'm going to go ahead and put a, a clean effective date on it too. It does go to uh, ways and means. Um, let's go ahead and put in uh, uh, January 1st of 2022. Questions or concerns? Um, Chair, I will, I'm going to be voting down on this measure um, for a number of reasons. One, economic injustice, being that harsher penalties on poor and also which relates to the SCR that we will be passing, hopefully next, in terms of uh, uh, being against racism. And also, it just sounds like an extortion to a private company is is kind of in entangled in this whole bit. So, mahalo. Hey, thank you. I, I would just res respond quickly that the, to own a car at all is a huge financial burden. So I don't, I don't, a dollar forty eight a day doesn't strike me as a consequential there, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can argue more later. I have concerns as well, um, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be voting. I'm going to be voting no as well. I okay. think um, that um, for people who can't afford it, and yes, owning a car. So why would we force somebody to buy, get a car so they can put this in? And then if I'm charitable in allowing somebody to use my car, now they got to put a thing in and now I have to be um, subject to this uh, interlock. I, I think there's need to be some changes. I'm certainly for keeping these people off the road, um, but I don't think this measure uh, does it. So um, I will be voting no as well. Thank you. Um, okay, sorry, I have a, I'm having a, uh, Eileen, what, I'm, what is your objection at this point? Uh, I just wanted to clarify that in uh, section one, uh, we added language that this compliance only applies for those who have installed ignition interlock. Okay, well, but the, the bill says that you have to install it. So I think we've covered it. So members, sorry for the confusion, but 
I don't, I don't think we have to change it any further than what I've already suggested. I'm sorry, we're in the middle of a vote. Oh, no, we're not. I'm still asking for comments. So we have a no for Senator Acosta, a no for Senator Kim. Any other questions or concerns? If not, Senator Kiyokololi. Uh, members voting on HB 1263, the recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting the presence of all members and the opposition of Senators Kim and Ocasio. Members, are there, uh, are there any other members with reservations? No vote for me. Okay, no vote for Senator Favela. Any other opposition? Okay, seeing none, Chair, recommendation adopted. Thank you, members. Uh, moving on to SCR, uh, Senate Con Concurrent Resolution 140, asserting that racism is a public health crisis and urging the state to commit to recognizing and addressing the resulting inequality inequities. Uh, recommendation here is to pass with some amendments. Um, we'll adopt the, the, the gist of the Hawaii Primary Care Association's amendments about ALICE, which is asset limited, income constrained, employed households. So that would require that, or we request that DOH and Department of Human Services identify the top communities with the largest number of ALICE households and summarize department activities to provide healthcare services in those communities. Request DOH and DHS and community organizations to develop a plan of action to reduce the number of ALICE households in the state of Hawaii. We'll add additional whereas clauses related to ALICE households and economic disparities contributing to a public health crisis. And we'll add additional recipients related to the Alice information and others request, um, as requested by the School of Medicine. And there are also technical amendments. Questions, concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SCR 140. The recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, noting all members present, are there any reservations? Any opposition? Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you members. Moving on to uh, SCR 149 slash HR 115, which we'll vote on together. Requesting that United States Congress pass a law that criminalizes any act by a current or former law enforcement officer, military personnel or politician that is contrary to the oath of the constitution. Um, pass with a fairly simple amendment. We'll add the speaker of the U US House and the majority leader of the US Senate as recipients of the uh, of the resolution if, it, if they pass. Questions or concerns? Uh, Chair, respectfully, I'm gonna be voting in opposition to this resolution. I think directing the federal Congress to take some action to criminalize uh, individuals pursuant to provisions of the US constitution is just extremely confusing and dangerous. I'm gonna go reservations on the next one because it comports to our legislative duties but at the federal level, it's so toxic. And I just think uh, it is the wrong way to go. But okay. I appreciate the intent. And so I'm just gonna be going in opposition. Thank you. Other questions or concern, concerns, members? If not, Senator Kiyokoli. Okay, members voting on SCR 149 and SR 115, the recommendation is to pass with amendments. Just amendments. Um, noting the presence of all members, uh, and the opposition of the vice chair. Are there any other reservations or opposition? No vote for me. Senator, uh, chair, all of the members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is SCR 1. Did you get my, did you get my no vote there, Jared? Sorry. Yeah, yes, yes two, two yes. no okay. votes. Sure. SCR 150 slash SR 116 requesting the Department of the Attorney General to propose legislation that criminalizes any acts by eligible public officials, including local law enforcement that violate their oaths to uphold the United States Constitution and Hawaii State Constitution. Uh, this one, you know, notwithstanding the, um, the concerns raised by the Attorney General, I think it's pretty obvious what the introducer is trying to do. So uh, recommendation is to pass as is. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on this. SCR 150, SR 116, the recommendation is to pass this resolution unamended. Uh, noting the presence of all members, are there any reservations? Uh, reservations for me. Reservations for Senator Kim, vice chair has reservations as well. Any other reservations? Okay, any opposition? No vote for me. No vote for Senator Favela. Chair, all other members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, so Senator, oh, I guess we're not quite to 10.30 yet. Okay, so we'll move on to 
our agenda for 10 o'clock, which is a DM agenda of um, bills that we heard previously. First up on this is HB 357. Uh, this is establishes a two-year statute of limitation for all actions for an inverse condemnation against the state, including a claim brought under Article 1, Section 20 of the state constitution regarding eminent domain. Recommendation is to pass with, some, with an amendment uh, for consistency. We'll put the two-year statute of limitations under Section 661.1. 661.1. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members HB 357 HD1 passing with amendments. Are there any reservations? Any opposition? No, vote for me. no vote for Senator Favela. Any other reservations or opposition? Chair, all other members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 1043. This amends Chapter 237D relating to the transient accommodation tax to repeal the misdemeanor criminal penalty for failing to register under the chapter or in placing with a fine structure. It makes uh, several other changes as well. Uh, the recommendation here is to go ahead and pass it out with some amendments. Um, find them, hang on. Okay, so we'll make an additional replacement of operator and plan manager with taxpayer in HRS section 237D12. We'll clarify in section four of the bill that the registration requirement in HRS section 237D4 applies to every person subject to taxation under the chapter, uh, not required to register under section 237D-4.5, their tax, and we'll make it effective on January 1, 2022. And this does go to WAN, so they will get another crack at it. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members, HP. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry Senator Casio. Uh, what schedule are we on right now? Uh, the 10 o'clock, I'm uh, sorry. I think it was the 10 o'clock, yes, the 10 o'clock agenda. Okay, sorry about that. Other concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members, voting on HB 1043, HD3. The recommendation is to pass this measure with amendments. Uh, with all members present, are there any reservations? Any no votes? Chair, all members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rashima Bakuro, we have two more votes, if that's okay, before we go to our agenda. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Uh, members, next up is HB 1377. This creates an electronic citation program under the judiciary and establishes an elect electronic citation surcharge and it's uh, currently a pilot program. Our uh, recommendation here is to make several amendments. We'll make it effective upon approval. We'll make it permanent and per the judiciary we'll move chapter 91 from the requirement for the judiciary to make rules because normally chapter 91 doesn't apply to the judiciary. And we'll lower the fee to two dollars from five dollars and we'll put in committee language the financials on expenditures and revenues that we've obtained and I don't believe that the program our, our reading of the financials is that it doesn't need $5, it needs $2 to be self-sustaining. Okay, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Uh, members voting on HB 1377 HD1, recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, with all members present, are there any reservations? Any opposition? No vote, thank you. So noted. Any other reservations or opposition? No vote. Thank you. Uh, Chair, noting the no votes of Senators Acasio and Favela, all other members vote aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Next is we'll move to our 1001 agenda. This has one reso on it, SCR 49, acknowledging the forthcoming centennial of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Uh, we had, we voted on this uh, last week, I believe. Um, but there was some concerns that it didn't quite uh, comport with uh, Senate Rule 61. So I would like to make a different uh, recommendation that I think will satisfy the requirements of Rule 61. So we'll so all in one all in one vote, we'll reconsider the committee's previous action on the resolution and pass the resolution with the following amendments. We'll add a whereas clause about similar resolutions introduced in March 21. 2021 in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives will add a resolution clause urging Congress to take action on those resolutions. And as passed at the first hearing, we'll add as recipients the governor of Oklahoma, the mayor of Tulsa, Tulsa City Council members and the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. We'll further add as recipients members of the Hawaii Congressional Delegation, the Majority Leader of the Senate, U.S. Senate, 
and Speaker of the U.S. House. And as we did originally, we'll have some text as well. <sighs> Questions, concerns, if not Vice Chair. Members, voting on SCR 49. So this is, so look, I think okay, okay, you're awake. So sorry, I had to catch the bus. Okay. The, te the technical the technical vote is reconsideration and then pass the resolution with amendments. I think there's a box for it there somewhere. Well, you don't have it with you either, so we'll, we'll take care Members, of it. Members, uh, voting to reconsider and pass uh, SCR 49 with amendments. Uh, noting the presence of all members of the committee, are there any reservations? Any opposition? Chair, all members vote aye, recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you very much, members. Now we're going, uh, we have a 1030 agenda with uh, Hawaiian Affairs as the lead, and I will turn it over to Chair Shimu Chair, I'm, hmm. I, can I ask a question real fast? Uh, Chair Rhodes? I'm super sorry, I was, um, mistaken in one of my votes because I was trying to find out where we were on that one. Um, did, for HB 357. I'm sorry, HB which one? 350? Is it possible to recast my vote? And if not, I understand. I have no idea. Staff, do, do you know whether we can go back like that? Does anybody know? Cannot, okay. I don't think so. I think it's That's over. Uh, we've voted, so you can, Thank you. You can you can note on the floor that you didn't. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank okay. you. Your vote on the floor. Mahalo. Senator Shimo Crow, go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to convene the joint um, Hawaiian Affairs Judiciary um, hearing on two measures. Um, and we'll, in the interest of time, just get right to it. We have SCR 163, SR 128, requesting U.S. Congress to amend certain acts for the purpose of broadening the scope of Hawaiian served by those acts. And first up, we have DHHL with comments. Hello, Madam Chair. We stand on our testimony with comments. However, I'd just like to highlight that we prefer um, SCR 165. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have, let's see, oh, let me something. I think that's the only testifier that we had signed up to testify live. Um, we've got five in support, three opposition, three with comments. Is there anyone else um, waiting to testify on SCR 163, SR 128? That's here. Okay. Then committee members, any any questions? Yeah, 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 question. Yeah, uh, Senator Favela. Right now we're gonna be lowering the blood quantum. And um, isn't that gonna be more of a a burdensome on my on our uh um beneficiary list? Um, we're already having problems doing what we need to do now. Um I don't think this is a time or place to be lowering our blood quantum now, um, at this point if we cannot even service the people that we need to service now. I, I think that would be a big injustice to the people that died and the people that's on the list. Uh, that's my comments, thank you. Yeah, and uh, in response, Senator Fabella, I, I, the, there's a lot of divisiveness on this um, resolution. And, and so in talking to the author and um, DHHL and some of the advocates, I'll, I'll discuss when we go into breakout, but. I'm going to look at taking that, that that part of the language out of the of the reso, and just putting the committee report about the blood quantum issue. So, any other um, questions or comments? Um, I, uh, clarification, yes. um, Chair. So, Senator Kim, yeah, you said you're going to take out that part. When would you be taking that out? Because this is a slash, and it doesn't go to another committee. Yeah, when we when we um when we do the decision making on oh. this on these two, yeah, okay. yeah. So I'll, I'll I've kind of, kind of confer also with um, Chair Rhodes that we'll take that that part of the language out. You know, those two there's two paragraphs that talk about eliminating the 50% blood quantum, and we're gonna um, our inclination is to take that out and put it in the committee report. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, then let's move on to the last um, resolutions, and it's SCR 165 SR 130 requesting U.S. Congress to consent the enactment of Act 80 Session Laws. Hawaii 2017. And first up, we have DHHL in support. I guess, uh, Chair, Shimo uh, Booker, we stand in support of this uh, reso. Thank you so much. Yeah, we had, we have several others. We have seven in support, no opposition and no comments. Is there anyone else that's here to testify on, on SCR 165, SR 130 in the waiting room or? 
Okay, seeing none members, any questions? Comments? Um, okay, I think we can go into the, the breakout room then. Okay, we're going to reconvene for decision making on the Joint Hawaiian Affairs Judiciary Committee on, on these two resolutions that we have, starting with SCR 163, SR 128. The chairs are going to recommend we pass with amendments. And we want to delete references to um, changing the blood quantum at this time, just because it's a divisive issue. Um, and we know that it's something that um, you know, we don't want to inflame um, the Hawaiian community at this point in time. So that would involve deleting the last whereas paragraph, as well as deleting the second to last paragraph, um, and then changing the title accordingly as well. Now, we also want to, in the third to last paragraph, change it from 1 8th to 1 32nd to be consistent with Act 80 that was passed in 2017. And then finally, on the distribution list for the last paragraph, we want to add the DOI, the Shaw, and the AHHL. Um, and technical amendments as well. And then in the committee report, we just want to note um, that the CFRs contain a 120 day requirement about notifying DOI about any kind of changes that the legislature passes to the, the act. And it's kind of, I just, just, I just note the federal requirements on that. Is that, Alyssa, is that kind of correct what you want, what you recommended? Yes, sir. So um, that that part of the act, um, when we passed Act 80 in 2017, um, mm -hmm. one of the requirements is for the department to uh, submit that request to the Department of Interior. So if the department did go ahead and um, go through with that uh, uh, procedure as outlined in the regulation, then we can uh, put it in the committee report. Okay. Okay. And our understanding is that they did go through with that, but so we'll mention that in the committee report. Okay, I think that's it. So members, any questions, discussion? Okay, seeing none, then Vice Chair, if you could please take the vote. Members voting on SCR 163, SR 128. The recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Shimon Bokoro. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Uh, Senator Acasio. Ole. Senator Ihara is excused senator favela oh chair recommendation is not adopted thank you okay so i guess there's no point in uh, me our us voting so i'll just defer it okay thank you thanks okay then all right moving on to the last resolution scr 165 sr 130 um recommendation is to pass with technical amendments any discussion or questions members Okay, seeing none, then vice chair for the vote, please. Uh, members voting on SCR 165, SR 130. Uh, the recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Shima Bokoro. Aye. Vice chair goes aye, Senator Ocasio. Aye. Senator Ihara is excused. Senator Favela. Aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Uh, for JDC members, same recommendation. Any questions or concerns? If not, we Apparently, we share a vice chair, Senator Keo Kalole. <laughs> members, SCR 165, SR 130, passing with amendments. Noting the presence of all members, are there any reservations? Any opposition? Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. We are adjourned.